for, for your kind introduction. I'm very happy to be part of this August gathering. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Ruttul, Dr. Amit for inviting me to be part of this academic feast. And I would also like to congratulate the organizing committee for curating such wonderful topics the next two days. And I'm also happy to share the platform with Dr. Minal. So with this introduction, let me start sharing my slides. Just a minute. All right. I hope my slide deck is visible. My slide deck is visible? Yes, perfect. Thank you yes, so much. Perfect. So what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is I'm going to navigate you through some of the data that we have over the years uh, about what could be the ideal weight for someone who's planning pregnancy and someone who's going through pregnancy. I'm going to show you, navigate you through some of the data and also understand what obesity, what impact it has on pregnancy. And subsequently, uh, Dr. Minal Mohit would deliberate on the science behind obesity. So all of us understand that women in general are quite vulnerable at two different, two important milestones uh, in terms of gaining weight. One, of course, during pregnancy and other during menopause. Now, during pregnancy, I think gaining weight is something which often it is overlooked about. You know, we kind of neglect gaining weight. Although we know that, you know, pregnancy is this part of the world, uh, you know, very well celebrated. Most of times it's overwhelming. It's a very overfed state. I think a lot of times we kind of attribute overfed state, you know, uh, gaining weight to probably a better prosperity or a better health. Uh, what we need to understand is that, you know, overweight or gaining weight has a profound impact, not just during the term of pregnancy, not just on the offspring alone. It has an intergenerational healthcare consequence for both the mother and offspring for many, many years to come. I'm going to shed more light on that. And we understand that obesity itself is the root cause for most adverse outcomes that are encountered during pregnancy. Obesity itself increases the risk of GDM by about four to nine folds. And obesity represents an altered hormonal and an inflammatory state along with the function of adipose tissue. We know that the adipose tissue does release peptides which kind of slow down the platelet degradation as well as increases a prothrombotic state. We also know that the adipose tissue releases peptides such as the interleukin 6, which also kind of modulates the release of CRP. All these increases the cardiovascular risk. We also know that the obesity, GDM, have risk factors of the birth of the offspring, starting from macrosomia, starting from uh, you know, birth injuries, uh, premature births, both uh, large for gestational age as well as small for gestational age complications, as well as shoulder dystocia, so on and so forth. So there are multiple problems that the um, offsprings encounter during the birth, as well as, as I mentioned, there is long-term intergenerational complications for both the mother and the offspring. As much as you know, having complications such as having overt type 2 diabetes, where the risk, the GDM itself increased the risk for overt diabetes by about 8 to 10 folds, as well as the risk of hypertension, cardiovascular disease, osteoarthritis, even malignancies such as endometrial cancers, breast carcinomas, as well as colonic cancer. So it increases so many complications even in the lifespan of the mother. And as I mentioned, even not just during the birth of the offspring, even in the life, it increases the lifetime risk of metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, so on and so forth, as well as the entire cycle repeats when the offspring undergoes pregnancy in, their, in her lifestyle so on and so forth. Although we know that the, uh, the, the uh, risk factors for obesity as well as uh, metabolic syndrome could be multifactorial, the intrauterine environment is very, very critical in terms of determining the lifetime risk of, uh, lifetime risk of a metabolic syndrome. So this shows you uh, data over the years about the association of obesity with macrosomia, hypertension, gestational diabetes, pre-birth, as well as a cesarean C-section. 
we can see that the, uh, the, there's a strong association between obesity and gestational diabetes. As I mentioned, it increases the risk of gestational diabetes anywhere between four to about nine times. We also have data from a Canadian study that over 50% of gestational diabetes can be actually precluded by mitigating gestational weight gain alone. Only with this, we can prevent over 50% of uh, gestational uh, diabetes. So that's the impact of uh, moderating or maintaining or optimizing weight gain through the pregnancy. So the first guidelines was proposed by Institute of uh, Medicine in uh, 1990. What we are seeing here is the revised guidelines, which was proposed in 2009, which categorized body weight into four categories, those with lower BMI, those with normal BMI, those for overweight between 25 and 29, and those with the obese over the BMI of about 30. Now, usual, uh, way, uh, the proposed the recommendation, the thumb rule for weight gain is anywhere between four to six pounds during the first trimester and one pound every week thereafter. So that's the thumb rule. That's the recommended weight gain. Of course, based, subjects who have uh, who are obese or who are overweight, the uh, uh, the weight gain is less moderate, less uh, compared to those who are underweight. Uh, there is no recommendation for weight reduction. It is only about weight maintenance, stability, even for subjects who are overweight and those who are uh, obese. Now, this shows you, the study shows you uh, the relevance of the recommendation that we just saw, the Institute of Medicine's recommendation in terms of optimizing weight through the journey of a pregnant, uh, through the journey of a pregnancy. Here, this compares subjects who achieved weight below the recommendation to those who achieved weight, who had weight much more than the uh, recommendation from the IOM. So as you can see from the data, the uh, C-section, the risk of having more severe diabetes and more intensive therapy was, of course, much higher in those subjects who had much more weight gain than the recommendation. In, in contrast to those who had a lower weight gain, were able to manage their diabetes quite successfully with only nutrition. They had lower incidence of uh, cesarean section. However, they actually had lower birth weight um, as well as um, uh, small for uh, gestational age uh, birth. So it, it just shows you, of course, reinforces the fact that uh, proper nutrition and proper weight is, is indeed required for the development of fetal tissues as well as uh, you know, creating reserves for lactation during the postpartum phase. Now, this Chinese study actually sheds light, kind of decodes whether these kind of recommendations that we saw, the IOM recommendations, is for the Caucasian population. It is a recommendation which was from the United States. So it, does that apply for Asian subjects is what this study kind of decodes. We know that the Asian phenotype is quite distinct, uh, which is different from the uh, West Caucasian phenotype. So here we had different BMI cutoffs in the Chinese subjects have the lower stringent cutoffs compared to the uh, proposed IIOM BMI. And what was seen is that the uh, according to the lower BMI cutoff, these subjects had a lower risk of macrosomia as well as large for gestational age. However, there were not much of the significant difference in risks of preterm, low birth weight, as well as small for gestational age. So this study kind of opens up the discussion that probably in this part of the world, perhaps we need to have a stringent BMI cutoffs than what has been proposed from the IOM. The, this is a new study which shows that uh, about one third subjects in the GDM group had excess uh, gestational weight gain with the reference to the IOM recommendations. So almost about one third of them seem to have uh, excess weight gain. And now when you look at the risk for large for gestational age was significantly higher in subjects who had normal glucose tolerance but had excessive gestational weight gain and also those who had adequate weight gain but who had gestational diabetes. And if you look at the odds ratio was twice in those subjects who not only had excessive weight gain but also had gestational diabetes. So subjects who had both gestational diabetes as well as excessive weight gain had two folds increased risk of having large for gestational uh, age in front. So this is another study which kind of uh, uh, decodes, uh, makes us, uh, we, we, the recommendation that we saw is for normal gestation. Can we apply this for GDN is what this, this study decrypts. So looked at uh, having a lower cutoffs in terms of the weight gain 
uh, during the course of pregnancy, such as 1 kg as well as 2 kgs. And uh, the 2 kg reduction had a lower prevalence um, of LG and macrosomia delivery. Uh, so this kind of speculates that, that subjects who are diagnosed with the stage diabetes should have tighter weight goal strategies compared to the uh, actual recommendations as such. So those who are diagnosed with gestational diabetes, what are the effects of the treatment as such? We are cognizant of the fact that, um, of course, the sarcoma ureas is going to contribute to weight gain. Insulin is also going to contribute to weight gain. What the study demonstrated is insulin contributed to much more weight gain than subjects who are on sarcoma urea. And the least gain weight gain was seen with those subjects who are able to manage their blood sugar levels only through nutrition. And another data that we learned from the study is that those subjects who had con better glucose control had better weight, uh, weight scale than compared to those who had uncontrolled blood sugars. Those who had uncontrolled blood sugars had much higher weight gain according to the recommendation than compared to those who had actually optimum blood sugar control. So this again corroborates with all the findings that we've seen earlier. Uh, this is a study from Japan which uh, shed light on that both the pre-gestational BMI as well as the gestational weight gain are both important in, uh, in, in association with the infant birth weight. They're significantly, as you can see, the statistical, uh, statistical is very significant compared to uh, when you look at both the pre-gestational BMI as well as the uh, weight gain which happens through the pregnancy. And if you look at Subjects who had a BMI over 25 pre-gestation, even in those subjects who had a normal weight gain, the BMI pre-gestation alone had an association with the, uh, the, uh, uh, with the infant birth weight. Similarly, those who had a normal BMI before pregnancy but had a much higher weight gain compared to the recommendation also had an, uh, had an association with infant birth weight. So this kind of corroborates the from the earlier findings that both the pre-birth weight gain as well as the weight gain that happens through the course of the uh, pregnancy are both important uh, in the association with infant birth weight. Now, how do we control? How do we control the uh, the weight gain that happens? I mean, back to the basics, uh, as we can see through multiple studies that have shown the way. I think going back to fundamentals of uh, of the nutrition as well as physical activity. In fact, is the cornerstone in terms of uh, you know optimizing weight through the uh, journey of pregnancy. Um, uh, um, we've seen again enough data to show that uh, uh, even early pregnancy exercise reduces the incidence of GM by about uh, GDM by about twenty eight percent. Even even exercise during early pregnancy within the first trimester also reduces. So we've seen uh, a lot of enlightening sessions um, on the nutrition. Um, so I'm not going to uh, deliberate much on that, um, but um, just some key takeaways. Increase uh, uh, fruits and vegetables of at least about 400 um, grams per day and uh, less than 10% of total energy uh, intake from uh, sugars and less than 30% of total energy from fats. And uh, 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 what is important is also to return to normal weight within about six months um, after delivery because those who continue uh, beyond six months are likely to retain weight a uh, lifelong. And again, the data shows that those who have achieved, uh, those who have gained weight more than the recommendation from the IOM are also likely to retain weight uh, post-pregnancy. So uh, there is a lot of uh, scope. Of course, uh, the, uh, uh, there is only about the data again shows only about 17 to 18 percent are actually following the recommendations. So obviously, this is not enough. Uh, much uh, work needs to be done in terms of you know percolating this message, reinforcing how important our nutrition, physical activity is. Of course, there are a lot of gaps, but but at this point in time, the landscape has indeed changed. We have a lot of fitness trackers. We do have the CGMS, and there are a lot of studies underway which would uh, you know which would kind of pave way for uh, for uh, more research, for uh, you know better outcomes. We'll get more data in the near future to see how better we can improve uh, outcomes um, in. Um, pregnancy. So with this, uh, I would like to pass on the baton to Dr. Minal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arun. And uh, before I take it up from you, I would ask the permission of the moderator. Would he like to intervene or should I jump?
Yeah. Uh, so, Dr. Minal, uh, please continue with this session and we'll take up any questions that we have at the end of the session. Right. So, thank you, Dr. Arun. You've set the platform just, just perfect for me. And just continuing from your session, you have talked about obesity and pregnancy, the weight gain, the Institute of Medicine study and the newer, newer targets, newer guidelines. So just to talk, what exactly is the science behind obesity? Whether we are talking of pregnancy, during pregnancy or without pregnancy, even in men, because it's a PSG symposium, we will be focusing more on pregnancy, uh, diabetes, uh, pregnancy and weight gain. But otherwise also, let's first understand what is the science behind obesity? So to put it in a very simple language, maybe it is just like, okay, the intake should match the output. And if the intake is not matching the output, there is something like savings account and the savings account goes on building up. Right. So what is the role of the brain? What is the brain sitting up there doing? Doesn't the brain know that this is not the weight that we need to put on? So we actually eat in three phases. One is a homeostatic eating. That is you eat when you are hungry. So when you're hungry, you eat. And this is the point of time when you actually eat whatever is served. If you are served salads, you will eat salads. If you are served fruits, you will eat fruits. And otherwise, even if you know the things are wrong for you, if you are served non-nutritional and calorie-dense food, you will end up eating the calorie-dense food. So this is homeostatic eating. After the homeostatic eating, there is something called hedonic eating. So, uh, Dr. Arun, can we move on? Can, can we move to the next slide, please? So, this is the hedonic eating. Now, after eating a plate of salad, when you are hungry, and after eating a plate of uh, nutritious, calorie-dense food, your brain now knows what is the pleasure of eating. So, your brain has registered that the salad was just filling my stomach, but not filling my brain. But this Delica delicious food or the de food delicacies are filling my brain as well as my stomach and they're also filling my adipose tissue. So there is something called a hedonic eating that we eat because of pleasure and there are hormones for hedonic eating as well as for homeostatic eating. So for homeostatic eating we have something called a balance between leptin and ghrelin. Ghrelin is your hungry hormone which tells you that yes I am hungry whereas hedonic eating is a result of your dopamine which tells you, wow, I like it. I like a burger or a chocolate or some ice cream. I don't like a plate of salads, of course. And the greens, definitely not. But this is homeostatic eating. And now we are talking of hedonic eating. Now comes there's something called the intelligent part of you, what Dr. Arun was telling the research. There is something called executive function of the brain. You know what is pleasure eating. You know what is homeostatic eating. But there is something called what to do, the deciding factor or the executive eating. So it is the executive eating which tells you go for your homeostatic eating only. Don't go for hedonic eating. So we have to actually as a part of the brain uh, management or an intelligent management, we have to carry out or maintain a balance between homeostatic eating and the hedonic eating. But when the two actually fail when the balance fails our behavior or the behavioral tilt goes in favor of hedonic eating then that is perfectly the time of pregnancy when women actually have all their food fats and that food fats are happily served by the entire family rather the women is suggested that what they should be eating or what they should not be eating so that is the time when the entire family is suggesting for going for a hedonic eating as a result, women during pregnancy not only end up gaining weight, which is the tar target weight, but the target is often overshot. The recommended weight gain in a normal pregnancy with ideal body weight is some, somewhere around 11 kgs. But any average Indian women end up gaining somewhere around 15 kgs in every pregnancy. And that weight gain is never lost back to the normal pre-pregnancy weight. And at that point of time, there is another pregnancy after, say, two years gap or a three years gap and another 15 kg is put on. So that is how the weight goes on building up. What are the complications associated with obesity that we all know? The metabolic complications and the list remains the same. 
whether it is a pregnant state or a non-pregnant state. Rather, in pregnancy, the challenge is that the similar metabolic complications are also transmitted by epigenetic mechanism to the next generation. And you will be surprised, but if it is a female fetus, then the similar pattern of metabolic derangement is transmitted to the third generation because the ovum which are there in the female fetus are also affected. So the three generations are actually affected by metabolic complications if the woman puts on extra weight or the metabolic complications set in during pregnancy. So now moving back to the house and of course Arun you will help me here by just jumping inside uh, along with me. Do you think this weight gain, which is actually recommended since ages and all our grannies have been telling us, eat more, eat for two, you have to fulfill the food for two now, eat properly and eat more, eat double, gain weight, all our obstetricians sitting in the house maybe or even our uh, colleagues, they have been telling all our pregnant women, your weight gain is not proper, eat more, put on some weight. Do you think this weight gain can, can be safely limited in pregnancy or is the pregnancy going to be affected if we really cut down on the weight gain which is recommended during pregnancy? Rightly said, but of course, I think this myth, I think we should largely overcome. We should burst this myth and uh, we should, as I was also mentioning through my talk, I think a lot of education and awareness should be enforced uh, in actually optimizing weight gain through pregnancy. Correct. So this last point, advise target gain accurately. So we as doctors have a very big responsibility of setting individualized targets for all your pregnant patients, depending upon your pre-pregnancy BMI. So depending upon your pre-pregnancy BMI, draw a chart and send the patient home with the appropriate target that they are supposed to gain or may not gain during pregnancy. So next would be Arun. My next question would be, though you have talked about the IOM guidelines, that is the Institute of Medicine guidelines or the recommendations, do you really agree that these entire guidelines can be extrapolated or projected to the entire population on earth, especially the Indian scenario? Yes, ma'am. Like I showed the Chinese study, in fact, over there, the stringent lower BMI cutoffs had better outcomes in the Chinese subjects. So I think, of course, if you cannot directly extrapolate, we need to kind of personalize according to the Indian setting. We may need to have much stringent BMI cutoffs than what has been recommended by the IOM. So I think that can go a very long way, Dr. Arun, if the PSG group decides to come together and we can find out our own Indian recommendations or the pregnancy target weight gain recommendations and we can some work out something and have our own guidelines very soon so moving to the next question very important question that really stands for all of us because we are not uh, obstetricians we are physicians so the most important question is that the patient is back to us after delivery and she is now with us with an increased bmi and another additional 5 kg weight so how can we actually work out and make our patient go to their pre-pregnancy weight? So what exactly are the important recommendations very crisply that we suggest our patients to get back as early as possible to their pre-pregnancy weight? So you've shown a thank you slide, but you need to answer. So what are the major recommendations are? Number one, please breastfeed. Lactation is promoted and at least for two years. Then begin your exercise and diet control immediately. Break the age-old myths of eating a lot of ghee, laddu and gond or something, which is a very traditional food here and with a lot of ghee and a lot of sugars. So please break all those myths. No ghee and sugars are required for your healthy uh, outcome of the pregnancy or out healthy outcome of the baby and the mother. Continue lactation. And begin your exercise as early as possible. Come back to your pre-pregnancy weight and rather utilize your pregnancy period to lose some weight rather than gaining weight, which goes a very long way in preventing your and your baby's metabolic future. Thank you.